on the big man. It's like you get He's in conference back there. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, let's all stand together for our statements of faith. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Christ the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe the three are one. We are the church. We stand as one. We believe in the Holy Bible. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe in resurrection, that Christ one day will return to earth. We believe in the blood of Jesus. We believe in eternal life. We believe in the blood that frees us, the bride of Christ. Let's join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with grateful and humble hearts, uh, unworthy of your undying grace. We appreciate and we love you for everything that you do for us. Thank you for letting us join together today in this great land of freedom where we can join together, worship as we see fit without fear of reprisal. Please be with everybody in our church family that cannot be here today for various and sundry reasons. We know we don't always know the reason, but we know that you do. We pray that you will be with the sick, be with those that need your loving, helping hand. Guide us, direct us, make us better Christians for you in our everyday lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Everybody, yes. Good. Good. Right. Okay. Okay. Good deal. Good deal. Um, you think she might actually be able to come back? Oh, yeah. Oh, really? okay. Has anybody heard how Bill's doing? He was, uh, I took him as a uh, tape in tapes. That's how old I am. Take him as CD machine. <laughs> he's, doing, he's, doing, he's doing pretty good. He, he can't get up and walk yet, but he's, he's working hard at it. You know? Okay. To, uh, don't feel bad about the old part because vinyl albums are making a comeback. <laughs> so uh, they are. I, I prefer vinyl albums. I, I know. But uh, <laughs> um, it's wonderful to be here today. Uh, we've enjoyed some uh, wonderful fall weather this week, although Amen. it be it a little bit wet, but that's okay. Um, for uh, all of you that heard me last week, week before, tell a little story of the, the little girl in my martial arts school that got bullied and assaulted on the playground. Uh, thank you for all the prayers. Her mother, her grandmother have said thank you so much. Uh, they have retained legal counsel in this matter, and so they can't really discuss it any further. But I can tell you this, that uh, little super girl, as I call her, because she likes to call me Superman, so I'm, she's Supergirl. Uh, we were at a tournament in Plano yesterday, and she, great attitude. She got second place in patterns, and she took her division in fighting. She got first place in that. And uh, before you leave today, if you want to see a really good picture, cute picture of her, uh, come up, and I'll show you a really cute picture of her from yesterday. So she's doing really well, and uh, she's got the entire school behind her. And uh, we expect nothing but great things from her. She's, 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 she's one of a kind. She really is Supergirl. So if you'll look on the, uh, and believe it or not, I actually went to a tournament and I didn't compete. <laughs> All I did was judge and referee. I was like, oh, nobody here wants me. Okay, that's fine. Anyway, if you'll look on the left-hand side of your bulletin this morning, our Mary Hill Davis, Texas mission offering, uh, we have a, uh, $410 of our $500 goal and uh, oh you can just keep walking you've been replaced <laughs> I'm just kidding There'll be a day. <laughs> no, no no time soon hopefully so we are uh, less than $100 away from our goal that runs through when, when this we, Sunday this Sunday whenever we decide, whenever we decide. Yeah. we'll be okay. done we'll be done today. we'll be done when we when we'll we get done. done so uh uh, again, keep that in your thoughts and prayers. I've never seen us miss a mission goal since I've been here, and that's been a long time. Uh, the, if you will read your bulletin, it says the Shermanan Greenhouse. I'm sure that's supposed to be Sherman. Uh, <laughs> accepting fall, winter clothes and shoes, uh, shoes, boots, uh, sleeping bags, tents, 
uh, the homeless situation in this county is uh, it's it's totally unacceptable. I've always said in this uh, age of wealth and technology, there's no reason anybody on the face of this planet should have to go to sleep without a roof over their head and food in their bellies. And uh, we can help the people in our area. This is a very worthy mission cause that we choose to be a part of. Not only the greenhouse, but the uh, Grand Central Station also. Um, both of these are very, very worthy causes. Uh, they're run by very good people that believe in what they do, spiritual people, and uh, they go out of their way to help the less fortunate here in, our, in Grayson County. So we need to be a part of that. I always say, we know of 2,500 homeless people, that's just the ones we know about. In Grayson County, that's larger than the population of White Wright, Texas. Um, when you think that an entire city worth of people goes without on a daily basis, it, uh, it'll bring you to tears. So we will continue uh, to participate in these worthy mission causes. Uh, treasurer's report for the month, uh, our roofing funds, a little over $2,400. Uh, Mary Hill Davis, as I said, 410, we're almost there. Our insurance fund for September, we have met our goal. We're a few dollars over that we'll put toward the October uh, obligation that we have on this wonderful blessing of an insurance policy that DAB is able to procure for us. Uh, very rarely do you get an insurance policy with better coverage and a lower premium. So that was definitely a direct blessing from the Lord. So we, uh, we are thankful and grateful for that. Uh, October 6th will be the WMU annual meeting at Antioch Baptist Church in Bells. Is that right? The same? That is the right church? Okay. Um, I hate to say I went to a service. I ended up at the wrong church. That would be horrible. Pastors and Wife Appreciation Dinner October 8th will be up at uh, the Georgetown Baptist Church uh, north of Pottsboro. November 5th, International WMU World Day of Prayer. Uh, I hate it when we have to designate a certain day as a day of prayer when every day should be a day of prayer. Uh, there should be no less amount of enthusiasm from one day to the next when it comes to prayer. Uh, Douglas, may I say something? We could, I agree with everything, what that doesn't show now, and they took it out because they designated it as the world. We've got WMU across the nations now, the seven continents, and 153 uh, individual places. And it's WMU, that's that day. So okay. It's, it's really neat that that's. Bringing the world together? Uh -huh. Okay. Broke out and it's been a beautiful. I, send, I say we send in a delegation to Antarctica. <laughs> Your mom helps out every year. She's not going to Antarctica. She likes fall, but I, she's not going down there. Uh, for some crazy reason, two things I've always wanted to do in my life. I've always wanted to climb Mount Everest, and I've always wanted to go to Antarctica, just to say I was there, which makes no sense, but you know. <laughs> And a lot of things I've done in my life don't make sense. Um, WMU Ladies Day Out. Uh, the Twin City Baptist Church WMU group going to Grayson County College Culinary Arts Building. I knew I couldn't get through a set of announcements without mentioning free food. Uh, like I said, somewhere in the Bible it says Baptists have to have food. So anyway, that's going to be, that's yet to be determined in December. Um, one, I missed the WMU International Mission Study at the Collinsville First Baptist Church, 10 to noon on November 17th. Uh, you ladies get together. I know y'all have a great time of fellowship when y'all get together, and uh, we've got a whole page of them right there for you. So, um, again, it's always hard to report this, but we lost two more police officers this week. Got in a gun battle with a suspected, uh, I believe it was a Grand Theft Auto suspect, and uh, he shot and killed two sheriff's deputies. Um, 39 law enforcement officers in this country have given their lives this year alone. Over 200 have been injured, doing their job, protecting you and me. Not one, of, every one of them that didn't come home that night had plans for the next day. They had plans for the next year. 
they had things they were going to do with their spouses, with their children, with their loved ones, with their friends. None of them woke up that morning saying to themselves, honey, I will not be home tonight. Uh, it breaks my heart, this war on police that we have here in the United States of America. It's worse than any other nation on earth. And this is one time where I don't like to say America is in first place the way we treat our police officers. 39 already this year. It's not even October yet. Last year we lost 35. So we've already gone above and beyond that horrid, horrid number that I hate to report. So please, if you see a police officer this week, thank them. Just say thank you for what you do. It will mean the world to them. The police officers in Greenville, we're a relatively small town, but they tell me every time I talk to them, they say, Doug, I can feel the hate when I roll my car out of the parking lot onto the streets of this town. I can feel the hate. And uh, I don't see an end in sight. They don't see an end in sight either, but they still strap that gun on every day, put that badge on with pride every day and go out to protect you and me and they do not do it for money uh, because they do not get paid near what they are worth. So please say thank you to a police officer today. Say thank you to a firefighter this week. Say thank you to an EMT. If you see a school teacher, tell them thank you because trust me, they are a lot braver than I am. So let's all Stand together. If you'll look in the front of your pew, we're going to do Laura's favorite song, Dwelling in Beulah Land. Yeah. yeah, I got it. <coughs> Far above the noise of strife upon the various falling, then I know the sins of earth feasted on every hand. Doubt and fear and things of earth in vain to me are falling. None of these shall move me from you, the land. I'm standing on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. I'm breathing from the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh, yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply. Lord, I am dwelling in the land. Far above the storm of doubt upon the world is beating. Sons of men in battle on the enemy withstand. Safe am I within the castle of God's word retreating. God of earth can reach me, this beautiful land. I'm sleeping on a mountain underneath the cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh, yes, I'm feasting on the land from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in beautiful land. Here we hear the works of God, I seek in contemplation. Hearing now His blessed voice, I see the way He planned. Dwelling in the Spirit, here I learn a full salvation. Gladly will I tarry in beautiful land. I'm living on a mountain underneath the cloudless sky. I'm drinking from the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh, yes, I'm feasting on a mountain from a bountiful supply. Just turn in your hymnals now to number 469. <clears throat> we praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus. 
Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of life through shown us the Savior and scattered. Story hymn this morning. Let's all stand together and turn to number 217. Because he first loved me, it tells me of a Savior's love who died to save me. He tells me of his precious blood, and his perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! Because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can fill my ears Who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus Oh, how I love Jesus, because He first loved me Join now in the spirit of prayer. Brother Steve, please, as we pray. Now, Father, and I, God, begin with just thank you so much for the privilege of being here. The salvation experience that we have by trusting Christ, the greatest gift that anyone could have. Amen. Well, let us not be selfish with it and not share it with other folks that they can come to have the same saving grace knowledge Amen. the same Savior that died for them just like for us. Again, we just ask you to be with Brother Dave to give the message this morning. Amen. Let our hearts be open and receptive. Bless this offering as our special mission offering as we gather it together and it goes out. We know that it's going to be used for your honor and your glory. We thank you for that. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Baseball season, so I know. Batter up. Same head, my music. He does that sometimes. You know, sometimes he hides my voice. There you go. <laughs> sometimes he hides my enthusiasm. But I find it. Good morning. Good morning. Sure great to see everybody here today. Yeah, amen. Sure great to be here. This is a place of rest, you know. Whew. Thank you, Jesus. Best day of the week. 
Yeah, I'd like to invite y'all to come out to the, if I may, may I say sure. this? To come out to the Whitesboro Peanut Festival, October 20th at 12 o'clock on the gospel stage in, in front of the post office, because I'll be there. <laughs> I can't believe they asked me. <laughs> but God said he had something for me to do, so, you know, I just said, okay. So I quit one of my other jobs. <laughs> she did promise me not to wear the peanut suit. <laughs> yeah, I did. Y'all pray with me this morning. Go ahead, brother. walks the dark hills, the highways, the byways. He walks through the billows of life's troubled sea. He walks in the cold, dark night. Yeah. Just before the message this morning, if you will look on the back page of your bulletin, we have a we have a very powerful picture there on the back page of the bulletin. Um, the Southern Baptist Association and the Texas Baptist Men's Association. I heard uh, a few days after the horrible Hurricane Florence hit the Carolinas that they were up and running and on the way to go and help these men and women that volunteer to go 
rebuild these disaster struck areas uh, do so out of love and out of a sense of purpose to not only help rebuild people's lives and property but to spread the gospel Amen. and many a person has been won to the Lord after staring into the face of disaster and we can thank the Texas Baptist men and the Southern Baptist Association for the work that they do in these disaster prone and uh, disaster struck areas all around the United States. Um, we hate it when disaster comes, but we know that's part of life. We know that's uh, part of the cycle of nature that uh, disasters are going to hit. We know that from history, um, but we can take solace in the fact that we have wonderful, wonderful people that volunteer their time, their money, their efforts to go and help rebuild not only property, but to rebuild lives and to rebuild souls by spreading the gospel. Um, many of these people are not youngsters. They're way up in years. Uh, they should be enjoying their golden years in retirement, uh, but they choose to go do the work of the Lord because they feel like that's what they're called to do. So uh, this morning, as we uh, sing our number 244, Spirit of the Living God, let us have silent prayer for all the volunteers that go out and selflessly give up themselves to spread the gospel. morning we would like to add to what Doug said a moment ago about praying for those who are working in disaster relief this morning uh, the most important thing that they do of course is to deliver a message of hope a message of love but it can also deliver a message of salvation let's take our Bibles this morning and go to the book of Matthew the 18th chapter We're going to begin to look at the 11th verse. Matthew 18, 11 says, For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. That's God's purpose. I had a man ask me one day, he said, Well, why did Jesus come? The reason Jesus came is to save that which was lost. See, in the original, when God created Adam and Eve, and they were there in the garden of perfection because there was no sin there. The animals had no, no bad nature. Everything grew and it just was automatically watered from beneath. And it was just a beautiful place because sin was not there. And we think about our lives this morning. I want you to think about a small child for just a few moments. A small child that is coming to this world and that child will learn the things of sin as they grow up. They're not born knowing that, okay? Adam and Eve were not created knowing that. They only knew about God's love. 
God's favor, God's protection, God's provision. But as they got older and older, when do most of our children develop bad habits as they get older and older? You know, they don't arrive in a diaper and steal cars. They don't arrive in a, di in a diaper and hurt people. They don't arrive in a diaper and do all the things they do as they learn to grow up. So the older they got, they become exposed to sin and sin becomes part of their lives. It was part of the lives of all of us who are Christians this morning at one time in our life. And then we met the master. And when the master comes into your life by faith, your life is changed. Amen. And suddenly you realize that I am what I am by God's grace. And it's not by works of righteousness which we do, but by our simple faith and trust in Christ to save us from our sins. So he says, the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. And down in verse 14, the same chapter, he says, even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. God's desire is that every single soul would become a Christian. But because of the world we live in today, that doesn't happen, okay? Man has to make a choice. That choice comes in what we call an age of accountability. That's when that person realizes that they have a great need of Christ that only Christ can satisfy. I have a load of sin, I can't get rid of it anyway. I can't be so good that people forget it. I can't be so good that I can get it off my record. I can't be so good that it doesn't bother me. I have to come to Jesus. So if you look there, just maybe across the page of the 19th chapter, beginning in verse 16, it says, and behold, one came unto him, that's Jesus, and said, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Now the key thing there is where he says, what good thing shall I do? And the Bible requires no good thing of us because our good things are always dirty anyway. Before we meet Jesus Christ, our best deed is a bad deed. Our best statement is an improper statement. Our best action is not what God is pleased with. And he said to him, why do you call me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. Perfection is God. There was perfection in Christ because he's part of the Godhead. And so he said, why would you think that good was any place but in God. I can't do anything that will make me good before God without knowing his son, Jesus Christ. And then he becomes my righteousness. He pays my price and I'm washed in his blood and you're washed in his blood by faith if you know him. And then suddenly we become part of the family of God and our perfection in his Christ. As a Christian, we continue to have problems, don't we? Yes, we do. We stumble, we fall, we falter. We're not perfect people, but we have a advocate with the Father, the Bible says. Now an advocate is like an attorney. He's someone who represents you before the court of God. And his name is Jesus Christ. And the Father says, Christ says to his Father, Father, that's one of mine. And Father, you and I both know they're not perfect. They messed up yesterday. They messed up this morning. They messed up last week but they asked me to forgive them, so I have. Then God will smile upon us. And so we find there that he said, what good things shall I do that I might have eternal life? He said, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. But if you would enter into life, if you would enter in, that's a great phrase, keep the commandments, okay? The first commandment of Exodus chapter 20 is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That means that you've chosen God and you've been faithful, and you have not had anything come between you and God. You know, a lot of times I'm, people say to me, we may be talking, some will be said about idols. They say, well, people today don't worship idols. I said, you need to wake up. People do worship idols. See? Anything that comes between you and God is an idol. If this represented God and this is me, and something else comes between me and God, then there's an idol in my life. There's supposed to be nothing between you and God. God comes first. Amen. With God, you know, in the New Testament, Jesus amplified that by saying, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All other things will be added unto you. If we get the first one right, the rest of it takes care of itself. Amen. If we trust Christ as Savior, the rest of our entire life is very, very, very small stuff. Now, we think it's big stuff, but it's not as small stuff. Our friend Zig Ziglar used to wrote in many of his books, he said, when you settle a matter between you and God of salvation through Jesus Christ in faith, then you've got everything won. It's already over. That's the most important thing. Then he goes further and says, and Jesus said to him, which? 
he said to Jesus, which? And Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou commit adultery, nor steal, nor fair false witness, honor your father, honor your mother, thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. And then the young man said in verse 20, All of these things I have kept from my youth up. For when I was a little child, I learned to honor my mother, honor my father, not to tell lies, to not to steal, not to take the neighboring boy's toys. All those things I've learned as a little child. And now I've grown up into a man. And those things of my childhood are still with me. But then look at the next thing he says in verse 20. What do I lack yet? What's the young man saying? There's still something missing. My performance doesn't make me happy. My performance doesn't give me assurance. My performance doesn't make me know I'm doing all the things I can be doing. So he said, what am I lacking? He might say, like, I'm doing the best I can. That doesn't qualify with God. So he lacks something. Let's what, see what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you will be perfect, and in the New Testament, the word perfect means saved, go and sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Now, when you look at that, you say, that is a tremendous demand of Jesus to ask the person to do. Go down to the bank and drain your bank account and give the money away. Go to the house and write the last check that'll clear and, and, and give it away. And put me first in your life. To follow Christ is to put Christ first. And so Jesus asked him to do that. And then come and follow me. What's that really mean? Don't let anything else be important to you in your life but Jesus. Amen. That's what that really means. Your life now becomes, should become what Jesus is and what Jesus wants and what Jesus directs by his spirit. And then he says, the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. You've heard me say it many times. What the young man was saying was, Jesus, you cost too much. You cost too much. No, he doesn't. The greatest bargain of our life is when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and as our Savior. And if we don't learn that great lesson, then we have other challenges that come into our life. Let me read to you from the book of Mark. I mean, sorry, I apologize. Mark, Luke. Me and Mark are not talking together this morning, but me and Luke. In Luke chapter 11, and look at verse 23. Luke 23, 11, 23. He that is not with me is against me. And when you tell people that's what the Bible says, they'll say, it doesn't say that, but it does. It does. It does. It's in the words of Jesus. Jesus said, if you are not with me, if you have not joined me by faith, as a believer and a follower, then you are standing against me. Now to clarify that and make it a little bit easier for us to understand, he adds, and he that does not gather with me scatters. What's Jesus gathering? Souls. As beast boy and girl and man and woman comes to Christ by faith, they're added to the, fa to the family of God. And he said, but if you're not doing that and you're scattering, then you're taking people away from God. And sometimes people say, well, I would never do that. But our actions do that. Actions and attitudes that don't put Christ first in all the things that we do. Then he says in verse 28, he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. Now, hearing's not enough. You know, that's when someone tells me, well, I'll say, are you a Christian? They say, well, I went to church last week. Mm -hmm. That tells me they went inside a building. It doesn't tell me anything about a relationship. Our churches are filled with people in our pews all over the world this morning and yesterday that were not Christians. It's popular to belong to the church. That's what people do. But it's not popular to believe in Jesus. That's the difference. You know? Coming to church and sitting on the pew doesn't make you a Christian more than parking and standing in the garage will make you a truck or a car. That would say it'd be foolish, wouldn't it? Yes. You know, I'm going to go out and pretend I'm a car. I'm going to go out and stand in the garage and I can just be a car. I might want to be a Ferrari or a GT500 or I might want to be an exotic car or something. But that won't make that happen. I'm still Doug. And if we're lost and we sit on the pew, and I used to do that myself before I became a Christian, I felt good about going, but it didn't make me a child of God. I had to choose him as my savior. I had to ask him to save me. I had to want to be part, him part of my life. 
And so he challenges us. Blessed are those that hear the word of God and keep it. We have to become, as the Bible says, doers of the word. Okay? Now, we have a guiding situation. Two things I want to talk about quickly here in the 11th chapter of Luke. Verse 33, it says, No man when he hath lied to a candle puts it in a secret place. You know, at home we have lamps. And the lamps have shades. Y'all didn't know I had shades on my lamps, did you? But our lamps have shades, okay? And inside there is a light. How many of y'all go in and take the little fiddle off, take the shade off, turn your light on, and put a real thick, black, heavy thing over it so the light won't shine? Do any of us do that? No, sir. No, we don't do that. Why don't we do that? We want the benefit of the light, okay? No man, when he has lights a candle, puts it in a secret place, neither in a bushel, but we put it on a candlestick. Or we light it at the top of the lamp to shine the light across the room for we can see and benefit from it. Okay? The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thy eye is single, thy body is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body is also full of darkness. God said, I gave you an eye so you could enjoy the light but I also gave you an eye so you can understand the difference in lightness and darkness. Amen. Think about that. If you went into a bookstore today, you might choose a children's book or you might buy something in the double X R rated adult section. That's a choice, isn't it? Yes. Sure it is. And that choice will be determined or motivated by your relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we have to make decisions every day about a whole kinds of different things, you see. In verse 35, it says, Take heed therefore that the light which is new is not dark. You see? That God, you will let the light of God illuminate your daily life and daily walk so men can see the power of Christ in your life. Now, I want to read you a little bit about in book, the book of John chapter 7. Then we're going to go to chapter 8, but chapter 7 first. And I want you to look in verse 45 and 46. Then came the officers to the chief priests of the Pharisees, and they said to them, they sent them to get Jesus, and they said, Why have you not brought him? What are you guys doing back here without Jesus? We sent you to get Jesus. And the officers answered, Never spake a man like this. He talked, we never heard things like what he talked about. And the obvious answer of 47 is, Then answered the, the Pharisees said, Are you also deceived? The guards didn't find deceit in Jesus. The guards did not find anything wrong with what Jesus was saying. As a matter of fact, their hearts were excited about what Jesus said. We never met a man who talked like that. And we don't know what Jesus said to them. Maybe he said something simple like this. Following me will give you peace that passes all understanding. Maybe he told them that, you see, to think about that. When you know Jesus, Troubles don't float away. They're not gone from your life, but they don't bother you in the same way. You see? They don't bother you in the same way. We have a peace with God that transcends what's happening right here, right now. Our faith is an eternal faith. It's not just while you're here. It's after you leave this old place, you see? And I was looking at statistics this morning. I got up early, and Annabelle was finally sleeping good, and I slipped out and went to my office and turned on the computer. First thing I did, I went and prepared my message, but then I turned on my computer and I was looking up, what's the chances of me living to 100? Okay? And the research said if I had reached 75, my chances of living to 100 are .014 out of every thousand people that live on the face of the earth. You ain't got no chance at all. It don't sound like it, you know. Now, not many days ago, I met a, I met a, a, a man that was 100, but he's real. They're real rare to find 100-year-old people. And every once in a while, the, the television talk about the, they visited such and such, and he was 100 or you know, 108 and 106 and 102. Matter of fact, one of the men I work with, many of the ladies have met him, Mr. Holcomb, he had an uncle that lived to 108. But there's very few of those people running around the country, you see. Okay? Now, if you're 75... If you've gotten to 75 years of age, your chances are about one in three that you'll live to be 90. That's, that's a little bit better, you see. 
But the bulk of people in this nation do not live past 75. See? So what does that tell us? Our time to prepare is short, you know? It's a short time to prepare. So now if you go over to chapter 8, here in the book of John, verse 24 says, here's the difference between you and God. Let's start in verse 23. John 8, 23 said, He said unto them, that's Jesus, You are from beneath and I am from above. You are of this world and I am not of this world. I say therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Now we're going to die anyway, okay, unless the Lord comes. Then we'll be translated and changed. But we'll either die in our sins or in the forgiveness of sin by faith in Christ. Amen. And that's where everybody is. If we went to a thousand funerals today, every casket would contain someone who either died in their sins or who died in their faith in Christ. And that'll be the only difference there'll be in those people. Yes, okay. We might pass a $4,000 casket. We might pass a $20,000 bronze casket. A man I noticed in the Middle East got buried in a $4 million gold casket, you know? And I thought that wasn't wise. That'll give grave diggers ideas. But, <laughs> It didn't make any difference what they bury you in, does it? Because it's not about that. It's not about your earthly service that they'll give you at that funeral service. It's about what decision did you make for Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So there in the eighth chapter of John's gospel, he tells us, verse 34, Jesus said to them, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever commit a sin is the servant of sin. When we commit a sin, and we do that, probably sometimes daily. We have two types of sins that happen in our life today. We have sins of omission, and I think that's where we get Christians get most of our bad marks. That's when we know what to do and don't do the right thing. That's a sin of omission. The Bible said to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. And then we have the fact that we sin because we're motivated by Satan. Satan said, it's not as bad as you think it's going to be. Now, if you went back to Genesis chapter 3 and read the story of the temptation of Eve by Satan, you, you'd find out what did Satan start off saying to her. She said, if we eat of the tree of that tree right there, if we eat that fruit, we'll die. And the first thing Satan said, well, you won't die. She didn't know what die means. She'd never seen anything die, not even a fly. She'd never seen anything die. She didn't know what the word die meant at all. Think about that, you know? But she took God's word, didn't she? God says we'll die. And Satan said, but you won't die. And what does Satan want you to do? Believe him and he knows you're going to die. But he wants you to die without Christ in your life. He wants you to die without being washed in the blood by faith. He wants you to die by not choosing Jesus as your Savior because that's what Satan's business is. Amen. Verse 36, therefore, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. There is nothing else that separates us in the entirety of our world's experience today. Verse 47 in John 8 says, He that is of God hears God's words. You therefore do not hear them, Jesus said, because you do not know God. Now, for those of you, if you had never talked to Annabelle on the phone, we'll use her for example, and you call up and you get Annabelle on the phone, and you've never heard Annabelle speak, how do you know that that's Annabelle's voice? Now, I know her voice on the phone. I know a lot of your voices on the phone. I know when I call Steve, I'll always get this message. I'll call you back when I find the phone. I know that. I got it this morning. I get it most days. But I know what? When he finds the phone, he will call me. Okay? But we wouldn't know, recognize, you wouldn't recognize her voice if you'd never talked to her before. See? If we haven't talked with God and don't know God, then we don't know his voice. But we always know the voice of Satan because Satan's voice is known by every living soul. And so what we find here in this passage, he talks to us about that, you see? Now, verse 11 of 2 Corinthians chapter 2 says, lest Satan should get advantage of us. Now that's what he wants more than anything else. He wants to get advantage of you. For we are not ignorant of his devices. The first thing Satan's device, first of Satan's devices is the lie. He told Eve a lie and she fell for it. He tells us a lie and sometimes we fall for it. He is the lie according to scripture. Now, 
He also says in chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians, verse 2, You are a letter or epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, not with ink, but with the Spirit, Holy Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. As such trust we have through Christ to God. You can't know God without knowing Jesus as Savior. Amen. The Lord Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me. So there's no other way to get to God without trusting Jesus as your Savior. Now, verse 6 of that third chapter of 2 Corinthians says, Who hath also made us able ministers of the New Testament. Now that's not just Paul, that's every Christian. Every Christian can administer the gospel. We can tell others about how we came to know Jesus and how much Jesus loves us, how much Jesus wants us to follow him, and how important it is for our lives to be washed by the blood of Christ when he pays for our sins before God. Now there's some sadness in this uh, book of 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter and the third verse. If our gospel is hidden, it's hidden to those that are lost. Who needs the gospel the most? Lost people. Before I became a Christian, I needed the gospel desperately, desperately. I can testify this morning that before I became a Christian, I had Sunday school teachers that said they were praying for me, members of our church that were praying for me, a mother that was praying for me, but that didn't mean anything to me because I was happy where I was. Until one day by God's spirit, I knew I wasn't in a good place. I didn't have a good relationship with God. I was as lost as I could be, as far away from God as I could be. But I know this, the blood shed at Calvary can reach out and touch my soul and cleanse my soul when I trust Christ for that salvation experience. And thank him for washing my sins away, okay? So if our gospel is hid, it's hid to those that are lost. In whom the God of this world, now by the way, that's Satan. This is his old world. He's in control and down here, what does he say? in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of those that believe not. And if he didn't blind their eyes, what would happen? Lest they would see the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God should shine unto them. They'd come to know Christ this morning if Satan's influence was gone. Every, every soul in the world would trust Christ this morning if Satan's influence was gone. And there was nothing but gospel there. But that's not going to happen because we have a diametrically opposed challenge. We have the power of God and we have the power of Satan. God's power is greater than Satan's power, but Satan's power is greater than man. So it's God, Satan, and man. And as long as we're living in this old we're sinful world, we're gonna have Satan trying to blind our eyes, to close our ears, to close our mouths, to shut off the gospel from us, because he doesn't want us to know about the plan of salvation. You see? He doesn't want that to happen. But God has done some great things for us. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 4 and pick up in verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Once we get to see Jesus for who he really is, the Son of God, who came to suffer, bleed, and die for me. But not just me, did he? For all of us. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sin and all your sin. But that doesn't apply unless you come and accept. You know? It's just like if I announced this morning when I'm going to give, a, I'll give James and Pauline a trip around the world. And it's down at the travel agency. And here's the address and the phone number. And all y'all got to do is go down and just pick up the tickets and take off. What would happen if they'd had that story and they got in a car going home and he said, do you really think the preacher did that? He said he did. He said it's ready. He said it's waiting. Are we going to go to it? I don't think so. Sure, he, you know he's got to be kidding. You know, where in the world did he, what did he do, rob a bank to get that kind of money, you know? So they just go on and drive down to Savoy and feed and take care of the goats. Goes in and she fixes lunch or something. And, and the time goes by and it goes by and it goes by and it goes by. And finally one day I said, Oh, you got your tickets ready? Y'all playing? No, we didn't do that because we do. He's just kind of funny with us. Well, God is not funny. When he sent Christ to the cross and Christ committed to die for our sin, he wasn't funny. He did it and he did it exactly like he said. And it's available to everyone who will come and trust in Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Now, let's look at Philippians chapter 1 for just a moment. 
we begin to close the first chapter of Philippians the sixth verse being confident of this very now this is a great verse because this says as a believer this takes a lot off of your back this morning of how you're going to live this Christian life it says you can be confident of this very thing that he Jesus which has begun a good work in you he will perform it Amen. until the day when he comes back for you or calls for you that takes a lot off of my back today you know my, my striving for perfection that I can't accomplish anyway in this life, Jesus takes care of. Right. See? He stepped up the day to the Father and said, Father, guess what? This morning, Jesus trusted me as his Savior. He's now part of our family. And we'll take care of him all the rest of the way because he believed in me. He let my blood, by choosing me, wash his sins away. And now it's perfect. Now, you notice he didn't say Doug's perfect, but the situation's perfect. But Doug's still not perfect. Doug's not ever going to be perfect until Jesus comes. Then I will be perfect. See? We've got something to look forward to, don't we? We'll be perfect then. And how exciting that is for us. Then he says over in the ninth verse of the first chapter, Philippians, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, now, in knowledge is why we study our Bibles. We want to know more and more every day about what Jesus told us to do and expects from us and the joy of that. Amen. And then that you might approve things that are excellent, that you might be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and the praise of God. Our fruits of righteousness is what God does in our life that allows us to demonstrate the power that God has brought into us. If you have your Bible, look in Revelation chapter 20. We're going to pick up one verse there and there are four verses in 21 and we will be through. Revelation 20, 15 says, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Think about that. God has recorded your name when you chose him as Savior in the book of life. Amen. If you've not chosen him as Savior, your name's not in that book. If your name's not in that book, at the end of time in judgment... You're cast away from God to a place called hell. But whosoever's name was not found written in the book, cast in the back of life. So if you're in the book, you're okay. If you don't know Jesus, you're in deep trouble. Now, chapter 21 deals with Christians only. The dead have already been cast into hell who did not know Christ. This is our joy. These four, first four verses of 21. I saw a new heaven and a new earth from the first heaven and earth were passed away and there was found no more sea. I, John, God carried him with a vision of the future, saw the holy city of the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Nothing in the world is as beautiful as a bride. Nothing. Amen. You can look down that aisle, and I have so many times, and every bride you would say looks different, but they're all beautiful. Mm -hmm. The union is going to be beautiful. The life together can be beautiful. Not without problems and ups and downs and precious and strange, but in the totality, it's beautiful. And then he says, I heard a great voice out of the heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. The tabernacle is our place of relationship. He will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all their tears from their eyes. That's from what we saw at judgment. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. And all the former things are passed away. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't it wonderful to know that we won't have to spend eternity in heaven thinking about this old world? We'll have no knowledge of it when we get to glory. You know? We won't be worried about the stock market. We won't be concerned about the weather. We won't be concerned about the bills. We won't be concerned about this or without that. We'll just be focused on worshiping our Lord. Man asked me not many weeks ago, what, will you, what are we gonna do in heaven? He said, we're gonna worship the Lord. Well, what, how are we gonna do that? I said, the Bible said we'll stand before his, his throne and bow before him and sing his praises for all of eternity. Well, what time do we get to leave go to mansions? I said, are you looking for a dip in the pool? Well, I just, I just heard we was going to have mansions. I said, it'll be the one of the most glorious places you've ever seen. The other night in our Bible study, we determined what? How large it's going to be? 1,500 miles cubed. That's a giant cube, a box, 1,500 miles up, 1,500 miles this way, 1,500 miles this way, 1,500 miles that way. 
That's big. That's big. That's about like from here to California to the coast in one direction in a cube. And the glory of God will fill it. The Bible said we won't need that lamp I talked about earlier. We won't need a light like this because the glory of God will fill it. Amen. We won't need the sun to come up because there'll be no need of the sun. There'll be no need of the moon. No need of the moon because there'll be no night. No need of the sun. There'll be no day. The glory of God will light it. Amen. Isn't that going to be wonderful? Now let me tell you something really exciting. Nobody gets a TXU electric bill. Okay? The glory of God will take care of it. And God will provide everything for us in that beautiful place. My prayer today is that you know Jesus. If you don't know him, that you ought to come and, and discuss with us about how to come to know Jesus. Because it's so emphatically important to what your future shall be. Not the future just here, but the future forever. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we're grateful today to be in this place and have the opportunity of worship and prayer. We're grateful this morning, Lord, that we can come together and search your word and glean from that the things you would have us to know and to believe. We ask now you'd look upon us with favor and forgive us for our sin of our shortcomings. And I challenge the hearts before me today if they don't know Christ to trust in him. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. Stand with us, please. Three hundred. stop and think about how fragile life is. What a small string it seems like we hang upon. I was looking the other day as Alan and I came out of Dallas on, uh, actually Allen on Friday, and the signs of the estimate there will be 3,200 people die on our streets and highways this year from just talking on the telephone. We were driving down the road the other day, and a man was like this, and he was texting. And he went probably for a mile like that, never looked up. I'm watching him. And that's not what we need to be doing. 3,200 people go out from this world to face God in judgment talking on a telephone, you know. I thought it was interesting in the city of Frisco, the first ticket issued for talking on a telephone was given to a police officer. <laughs> <laughs> and why was that? Because we have formed a habit. We just don't think before we pick up the phone. We don't think before we make our actions and that makes a tremendous difference. Let's join together, please, the spirit of prayer. Almighty God, we're grateful for your gift of Jesus to us. We just love you, thank you, and praise you, and lift you up for that. What a wonderful thing it is to be able to pray in the name of Jesus to a Savior that loves us and died for us. We ask now that you, by your spirit, guide us this week and keep our minds focused and intrigued with the things of the Lord we might be able to grow and be stronger Christians and a better witness for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord. We have a surprise study tonight at 6. Oh, yeah.